Welcome to GCP Next. Uh, you know, today morning on the Twitter feed, uh, you know, there was someone saying, oh, no, here's the keynotes, and we have Disney, we have Home Depot, we have HSBC. Google's going all enterprise. Where's all the nerd stuff? Well, here's the nerd stuff. So welcome to the nerd stuff, right? <laughs> What we're going to talk about today is how to do data science on GCP. All right? Who does data science on GCP? Data engineers. Right? So we're going to talk about how a data engineer can do data science on GCP and how GCP makes that easy, makes it auto-scaled, makes it auto-awesome. The popular imagination, if I told you what machine learning is, machine learning has been in the air today. Right? And we say, what is machine learning? People say, well, you have lots of data. You do some really complex math somehow, and out comes magic. Right? That's basically what people's imagination of ML is. In reality, though, what is ML? ML is a lot of work. You're going to spend a lot of time and effort collecting the data. You're going to use all your ingenuity, all your knowledge, all your experience to organize this data. And then you're going to basically bring your insights, your domain expertise, in order to create a model that somehow represents what you know about the domain that you're working in and how it relates to the data. And then you're ready to go. Once you have this model in place, you can now train this model. And that training is all very automatic. And then you end up in magic. right? You do end up in magic. But in order to get there is a lot of work. And what GCP can help you with is to make this work much more tractable, much easier to do. So what we're talking about here is that GCP is a place where data science meets data engineering. And I would like to introduce to you my two colleagues, Reza, who's going to play the part of a data engineer. Myself, I'm Lack. So we're going to play this role of uh, myself as a CTO, the head of BI for a company called Alphaplex. We make widgets. And Alex here, another of my colleagues, is going to play the part of a data engineer. So what's the scenario? The scenario here is that we run a factory. And in our factory, we make widgets. And of course, a factory has a bunch of different machines. And these machines heat up the factory floor. Right? We, have, we have a factory. These machines heat up the factory floor. We have people working in these factories. So we have to ensure that this factory is efficiently cooled. We need to make sure that we're not spending too much on cooling the factory. But if the factory floor gets too hot, then we're going to result in wear and tear. So we need to figure out the optimal way to cool the factory floor. Fortunately, we've been collecting data. Right? We've been collecting data, and we'll be able to use that data to solve this problem of how to efficiently cool the factory floor. What we need to do is that we have a factory, we have an air conditioner, and we need to figure out when to switch on the AC. If this sounds familiar to you, this is kind of the same issue that we do in Google data centers when we need to basically figure out how to efficiently cool a data center. This is a common problem, right? So we need to figure out when to switch the AC on. We have a bunch of different machines, right? And these machines essentially heat up and cool up, uh, cool down right, the, the factory. So we need to basically figure out how to keep these machines and how to keep the people at safe temperatures. And what data we have is the inside temperature of the factory, the outside temperature. And the reason we have that is because we went to our chief scientist, Isaac. Right? And Isaac told us that he actually has this formula. Right? So Isaac has this formula that said, now if you know the inside temperature and you have the outside temperature, you do all of this math, I'll tell you that if you have a bowl of soup, how long is it going to take that bowl of soup to cool down? So Isaac says he has the exact formula, but we say, hey, Newton, hold your horses, right? We don't want to basically use that formula because real life is a bit more complicated than just a bowl of soup. Why is it more complicated? Because, right, 
we can monitor the inside temperature, we can monitor the outside temperature, but there are other complicating factors. Complicating factors like, right, which machines are running? How many machines are running? Right? What are the machines doing and how much are they heating things up? Right? How many people are in the factory? And all of these kinds of things make applying that heuristic, that rule that we had, really hard to do. And if you think about machine learning in the real world, it's usually a replacement for you used to have a bunch of data, you used to have formulas, you used to have rules, you used to have heuristics, and now you change those out and replace them by something that learns from the data. So we have collected data over time about the factory's inside temperature, the outside temperature, what was running in the factory right, at different points in time. We have that data, and so we will basically show you that, that journey. Right? But first, let's start where we are, and let's say that we know things about our factory floor, we know the inside temperature, we know the outside temperature. Let's figure out how to basically balance the cost of cooling versus the cost of the repairs that are going to result if we let the temperature get too high. Right? That's basically the balance that we have to strike. So Reza, let's build something cool. Okay, so um, I am the uh, data engineer and we're a small company. And so in terms of the number of data engineers, we have just me. So we have some constraints in terms of how much stuff I am able to do. And one of the lines that uh, Lack said very casually is, we've been collecting data. Now, as a data engineer, that line is potentially quite a lot of work for me. So let's have a look about the kind of thing that we needed to put together to actually collect that data. So we have this factory. And again, we have one data engineer. I want to make sure that anything that I'm writing is, first of all, production grade. Two, it will scale out. So while we might be doing an experiment right now with one factory, I want to make sure that if we have factories across the globe, if we have many thousands of IoT devices in that factory recording things like temperature, number of people, maybe tomorrow it's talk, um, measuring things about the machines themselves and sending that information on. No matter how much data I have, I want to be able to always absorb this data coming from all of these IoT devices. And it's important I do this in stream mode. One, it's important for the data collection and the processing. But two, as we come to see, when we want to do some more inference on that uh, data points. The, um, the next piece of collecting, after collecting the data, there's a couple of other things I'm going to need to do. First of all, I'm going to need to do some processing. And again, one engineer, I want to make sure uh, whatever I write is very small amounts of code. And uh, the system that I'm using are fully managed. So I don't have to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning to restart servers. or to do things like rebalance things because our loads have gone up. In that processing, I'm going to do two very simple things. First, I'm going to element-wise take that data to a repository for the propeller heads to be able to do their smart data science. The other branch of this is my very basic um, check to when to turn the AC system on. And that is um, a simple test that I'm going to run a sliding window across the, uh, the streaming data that's coming in. That sliding window is going to be five minutes long. Um, for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to do it every, the period of that sliding window is going to be 15 seconds. So every 15 seconds, that five minute window is going to slide down. I'm going to do a calculation of a mean. And I'm going to do a really simple check, which is if the value is over 30 degrees centigrade, then turn the AC on. I'm from UK, so it would be centigrade, right? OK, so let's think about the components that I'm going to use. First of all, um, I want to use Google Cloud PubSub API. It's a fully managed publish and subscribe API. It meets the requirements for it's global, so I can have many factories all sending messages to uh, uh, the API. I can have a single topic, so I don't need to worry about today I've got 100 messages a second, tomorrow I have hundreds of thousands of messages a second. I don't need to reshard, I don't need to think about partitioning, I just keep sending information into that topic. The next piece of the puzzle is the processing side. So I'm going to take this data that's coming from PubSub, and I want to process it. One of the other advantages of PubSub is that it is HA, and it will hold on to all information sent to it for up to seven days until a subscriber pulls the message and, both, and also acknowledges that that message has been removed. So the component that I'm going to connect to this is Dataflow. And Dataflow allows us to do both batch and stream processing in a pipeline. 
Um, in this case, we're just going to use the streaming capabilities. Dataflow will take care of spinning up machines, auto healing, all that other stuff that, again, I don't want to be concerned with. I just want to write simple declarative code on what my pipeline should do and then let the system get on with it. In that pipeline, I'm going to have two branches. The first branch is to go to BigQuery, which is where we're going to store our information. There are multiple choices of where you could land IoT data, especially as it's time series. Big table could be another option. However, again, just want to run uh, queries against this system. So BigQuery is a very good place to uh, land this data. The other branch is the simple test I want to do. Take this, the, the mean of the sliding window. If it's over 30 degrees, then tell the AC to either come on or off. And in this case, we're actually going to use PubSub again, although we haven't got it in this diagram. The reason we're using PubSub now is not as an ingestion mechanism, but as the glue amongst my data pipeline. So when I have a message, I put it back into PubSub. It can communicate with downstream systems in the factories to be able to turn this AC on. And just to see how this would look on our uh, pipeline as it's running, could you um, connect to the laptop, please? Thank you. So this is the monitoring UI from Dataflow. And it's actually showing uh, the uh, pipeline in motion. We've got the IoT devices being uh, pushing data into a topic that I am reading from. I am then parsing the IoT data. So it's coming in JSON format. I'm extracting the bits that I need. And then it branches out. The first branch is it element-wise is sending data to BigQuery. And by element-wise, I mean there's no micro-batching or batching. So as data's flowing in, it's immediately available to any queries the guys want to run. On the other side, I am doing our sliding window. So I create a five-minute sliding window. I will then extract the temperature from the data that exists within that five-minute window, pass it to a mean function. From there, we will uh, check if the value is over 30 degrees centigrade. If it is, I'm going to send it to two locations. The first location, again, is that PubSub, so that it actually can talk to the factories downstream. The other location is actually um, to Firebase. And the reason I'm sending it to Firebase, well, I'm going to show you here. So this is that basic test. It's that information being sent on to the Firebase engine. And this is essentially to help us visualize the tool. So as the data gets updated, that fact that it's gone yellow means there was a latest update from Dataflow pushing to it. Now I can actually visualize this in things like graphs that connect to the um, uh, uh, Firebase engine. And as you'll notice, you actually know when my laptop was down because we've got these flat lines going up because it didn't have any data at that point, and it's just jumped across. So this system will scale. Could we go back to the slides, please? OK. So the amount of code I had to write, um, this is the code for the data flow section. For PubSub, I just created a topic. There's nothing other than a DevOps action there. In terms of the code, these are snippets, but just to give you a flavor, in data flow, data that comes in gets turned into a parallel collection of immutable objects. And what we do with that collection is we run a series of transforms against the data. The first transform I do is saying, I want a sliding window. So here, those three lines at the top um, with uh, window into sliding window, duration five minutes with a period of 15 seconds. Of course, if we were doing this for real, we wouldn't use 15 seconds. We don't want the AC to come on and off that quickly. You'd put it as five minutes, but then you wouldn't see the nice flashing indication on the Firebase. Next, I want to actually do the calculation of the mean. Mean, sum, ca uh, count, all of these are standard things that people want to do with data in pipelines. So there's a primitive built into Dataflow. That single line of code allows me to get the mean from every single window. Next, we do our very trivial test, the check threshold. And that check threshold is nothing other than returning a Boolean if the value of the mean is over 30 degrees centigrade. So that's our very basic pipeline. Now we're going to hand it over to our very smart data scientists who are going to do some magic with that data. All right, thanks. OK, so I didn't get the mobile. Uh, microphone, so I have to stand here, which is great, because otherwise I run off. Um, so <laughs> from a data science point of view, what we just, I mean, what we just saw was uh, we, we have a rule in place for deciding when to turn the AC on and off, and that rule was, you know, is the temperature bigger than 30 or, or less than 30, right? So, so inside 
Google, with many of our products, we've been doing this rule-based decisions in our products um, a lot. And only in the last couple of years, we turned to machine learning to actually improve uh, the way our products work, make predictions, and, and increase the quality. So one example is, right, if you do a search on giants, um, it depends on probably where you are. Dep you know, if you're in San Francisco here, you might be interested in the San Francisco Giants probably. If you're in New York, uh, it might be uh, different types of Giants uh, football team versus baseball team. So we used to write these rules where you say, okay, here's the query. Um, you know, then based on the location, if it's San Francisco or New York, we, we, um, we give the user different search results uh, that are, you know, uh, focused on, on what the user is probably uh, desiring. Uh, in my case, I'm from Germany, so you know, if I search for giants, it might be the Dortmund giants, which I didn't even know existed, but I, I was searching for a team, and of course there's a German giants uh, team. Um, so Rank Brain is a good example of how we switched from using rules to going uh, to machine learning. Because instead of just looking at the search terms themselves and how, how often they appear in a, in a text um, and how close they are to each other, uh, we actually use natural language processing to determine the relevance of a document. And, and this is the third uh, uh, highest uh, you know, ranking criteria on how we determine whether a search result is further up um, or further down. And this is the biggest improvement we've seen in, in our um, search quality in the last couple of years. So if we turn to our problem, right, we want to cool a factory. Uh, we have this temperature coming in of 27 degrees. And then we're trying to decide, you know, what, how do we react if the outside temperature is higher or lower. Um, then we have different number of machines running. Um, and then you have new factors, right? So now people give off heat as well, uh, so you might want to consider that. Uh, but maybe the, there's different factories with different uh, um, factory sizes with different number of air conditioning units that you can set to different levels. These are all very different criteria, and you can see turning on or off the AC based on these rules can become very, very uh, hard to do or impossible to do. Right? So machine learning has been around for, you know, seems like hundreds of years. So Isaac is thinking, you know, could we use machine learning for this maybe uh, instead? So just a little uh, 101 on, on machine learning and, and in this case, deep learning, which I'll show you in, in a couple of minutes um, in, in how it works. Basically, it's a supervised learning. We use deep learning here. This is one method um, of machine learning that works really well for the stuff we do in, in Google. And um, it, it works by taking a lot of, you know, a lot of labeled data that you know that this is a cat, dog, whatever it is. You train, uh, you train a, a, a model in the first step, then you evaluate how well is this doing. Um, so you have a training data set, you have a test data set, you find out the quality, and you do this in an in a iterative approach until you have the quality that, that you desire. And then what you can do is, right, you can take that model, put it on the phone, uh, build a cool app to take a, a picture of a cat and decide, um, is this a cat or not, right? So this would be uh, applying the, uh, to the model, the model. So we're gonna also use this for um, our problem here. Um, so we can, we are, because this is all live, we're training a model based on all this data that is already being captured in BigQuery, right? So you have number of machines, inside temperature, um, maybe number of people or other factors that you can use. And then you can apply this model to actually make a decision to turn on or off the AC. Uh, whenever you do machine learning, it, or, uh, it, you're trying to optimize for something, right? So in, in, this in this case, we're trying to minimize the cost. And cost, in our case, is um, the cost, the, the wear and tear of the machines, right? Because we're saying we don't want the temperature too high because it is bad for the machines. They need to run at a certain 
uh, room temperature, and we want to minimize the cost of maintenance of buying new machines, right? So this is uh, just checking that the temperature is not too high. And on the other side, we don't want the AC running 24-7 because that's going to cost energy, and we don't want, we don't want to do that. We want to be uh, efficient in how we use that energy um, to power the AC, right? So we're defining a cost factor, which is a combination of those two factors, and we're trying to balance this out. Um, turns out uh, Google has its own factory floors, right? Our data centers, and we're actually applying machine learning here um, to, to optimize um, how we run certain workloads. Um, you can imagine a lot of the workloads that we do are actually around machine learning, right? So we're updating models and improving our recommendations on cat videos and stuff like this. And it doesn't matter if this is running in Oregon or in Finland or anywhere else. So machine learning is a good criteria to actually make that decision for us. And we've been able to reduce uh, energy costs to up to 40% when we apply machine learning. Um, and there's actually a cool white paper out. There's a, there's a URL um, on there where it talks about how we do this. And uh, these are some of the features used um, to actually um, create a model that is optimizing our, our own data centers. So if you remember our architecture that we had just a couple of minutes ago, uh, we're taking that, all that data, um, we're pushing it into BigQuery. Now we want to take that data and train a model. Um, so you might have heard of TensorFlow. It's great because I can just download it, it's open source, and I can do this here on my laptop, which I'm actually going to do. Um, the cool thing is I can then, when I'm happy with what I'm having with the, the data size, um, the small data size that I'm testing with, I can actually flip a switch and say, now I want to train on, on the billion data set with all the factories on, right? So doing that switch is, is fairly easy, right? Training with a smaller data set locally, but then going uh, full production and, and not being, uh, needing to be scared if it's, um, uh, you know, on the, if the data set gets too big or the features get too big, right? So to demonstrate this, I'm going to be using something called Cloud Data Lab, which is a Jupyter notebook um, hosted by, by Google Cloud. And um, I will be going into that uh, now, if that's possible. Can we switch to the demos again? Thank you. So this is... Uh, Cloud Data Lab, this is a notebook, so I can, it's pretty cool because I can um, share this with colleagues and we can, we can try to find a cool way to work with this data, right? So this is cool for experimentation. I can run, run Python code in here. I can run TensorFlow. It's one of the easiest way to run TensorFlow, uh, but I can also pull in a lot of the Python libraries uh, that are out there like Pandas that we're gonna use here as well. So I'm not gonna run everything here. Obviously, you need to do some setup, right? We need to define uh, the project and, and the cloud storage bucket and these type of things. Need to import um, some libraries. Um, define a schema that is um, representing the schema that we have in BigQuery. Here, um, we are actually going to pull the data using BigQuery. So you can actually see the query in here. Um, and we're, in that query, we're also defining the cost. So we're taking uh, a factor of, which is called unsafe, which is the time that machines ran in an unsafe temperature, which is above 30 degrees. Um, and we also have a, a factor of uh, how much energy was used, right? The power that we used uh, on the AC. So, so we have a, a cost, we have uh, the temperature, when the fan was turned on, the number of machines and the outside temperature. So we're pulling that into a pandas data frame. Uh, we're doing, um, if you remember, right, we, we have all that data to train on. Now we're gonna split the data into a training and a, a, and a, a training data set and a, a data set to evaluate our, our training. So this is happening, so we're, 
we're using a 90-10 you know, split of training data and testing data. And this is the output um, of, of some of the, the rows right in here. So you see the cost, the fan on, the number of machines outside temperature. Uh, that's pretty cool. So I'm going to go a little uh, further down uh, to the part where we're actually going to train based on all that data, right? So we're pulling all the data from BigQuery. And we're going to train a model. Uh, this is using TensorFlow. Um, it has two hidden layers. Uh, it says it right here. It says the number of iterations that we're going to go through. And we have two hidden layers, one with 64 neurons and one with uh, four neurons. So I'm actually going to run that. And hopefully, it, something will happen. Um, so this should just take uh, not more than seven seconds. Um, so it says local training done. So that means it's taking, um, it's created a model and it's, uh, turn, uh, it's putting it in a, in a directory that we specified, right? So now we have a model in the directory. And now we can do some prediction on that data, right? So we can give it some temperatures, some inside, outside, number of machines running, and it's going to give us uh, back a cost factor, right? Uh, so. Um, Here, is, uh, here comes the important part, where we actually now determine and evaluate how, how well did our model actually do, right? So remember, we, we had the training data, we have the test data, and now we want to compare uh, the two different data, uh, data points, how well did our predictions actually do against some test data that we held back and that wasn't used um, for training. So this is actually the table we get right here. So we have a, the true cost that we know about, and we have a predicted cost. Um, since this may be a little hard to, to look at and understand, there's also a visualization. So that's uh, one of the cool things also of Jupyter Notebooks, that you can use all these visualization libraries that are out there for, for Python. And you get kind of this heat map where you, based on a certain uh, true cost factor, you see the spectrum of what was predicted, right? So here you have the true cost, here you have the predicted cost, and this is a pretty good visualization giving you an idea how well are we doing. And maybe this is uh, for you, an indication for you to go back up and maybe uh, do some parameter tuning and some, some, try some things out, do a different split maybe on, on training and test and these type of things until you're at a quality that is good enough for, for your use case. Okay, um, now I'm at the point where we actually have a model, and, and what we're not doing here is we're not training this again on Cloud ML on a billion data points because we don't have the time for you all to see how, you know, how long this takes. Uh, so we are gonna keep the model as we have it, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna push it in Cloud ML, um, which means I can give Reza in a second an API call that he can use um, to ping, ping the Cloud ML API and give it some values. And these are the values that are going to come in through PubSub and Airflow, give them some values and make a prediction and um, on what should be, you should be, you know, what, um, what action should be um, taken. So what you could do actually is, right, you give it two numbers. You give it maybe the current temperature uh, indications and, the, and then you can say, okay, um, the way it's going right now, I might, uh, the way the temperature is moving right now, what if the temperature is one degree higher or two degrees higher? What would my actual cost be? Uh, so you get two values back, and that could be an indication for you to take action now or wait two minutes because the cost actually of turning the AC on in two minutes is going to be actually lower. So this is the, the type of back and forth uh, that I can now um, give to Reza that he can now hopefully without having to tear down his pipeline that he built can actually use um, in, in, in the architecture that he'll be demonstrating in a second. Great, so I think we go back to slides, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So um, the key component that I'm actually going to have to swap out is that check that I was doing against the temperature. So before, if we remember our pipeline, we had IoT devices all sending streams of data 
to PubSub. PubSub was consume, being consumed by Dataflow. We were splitting the data, sending it to BigQuery, which allowed Alex to be able to do his work. On the other side, we had that simple test where I was doing a sliding window of five minutes every 15 seconds, calculating the mean and doing a check. Now, I just need to replace that with the inference that we have now. And I also no longer need that sliding window. So that sliding window was just there for me to get an average rather than go point by point. Here, the system can just take each point by uh, uh, the values that we have and then give, it the, um, give us a prediction back. So the one thing I'll need to do is change from that check threshold, where I was just checking the temp value against 30 degrees, to the new code, which is to call the inference API. And the, um, uh, the inference uh, endpoint is the one that has been deployed with that version number. Uh, we have the package shape that I need to send to it. So that package shape is the JSON structure that I'll need to put together. That JSON structure comes from the same data that I was collecting before. So in order to actually switch this out, I will just need to replace my checksum with a REST call to the CloudML service. And then from there, the CloudML service is going to give me a prediction back. That prediction back will be in JSON format. I need to just extract the piece of data that says whether the fan should come on or off. And then through the same part as the pipeline, I will actually send it on to the uh, factory. And it will decide whether to be, it should be on or off. So let, if we could just go back to this uh, laptop, please. OK. So previously, the section that we hadn't shown was this middle bit, which was taking that data. And instead of doing the five-minute sliding window, it's actually calling the prediction service. We get the output from the prediction service. I have a simple uh, JSON deserialization to take the values that I want out from that. And then I send it again onto both PubSub and Firebase. If we go to Firebase, I'll actually go up a level now. We can see two data points. One was the original flow, which has got check weather over 30 degrees. The other one is now the inference uh, being called from the Cloud ML service. And the reason, actually, we'd want to keep both running is, like any good data engineer, I'm not going to just switch over from production in a second. Right? This is all good stuff. I trust Alex. He's done a great job. But I want to make sure everything continues working before I make that switch. And this is where we start doing the A-B testing. Right? In this case, we're A-B testing a very old, basic method of checking when the fan should come on with the new inference model. But as time moves on, let's say this is all very good, successful, and I actually make the switch, we're going to have different models being built. So maybe Alex decides that actually, given the data set, every week we want to rebuild the model. Maybe it's every day. Whatever it is, the Cloud ML service will allow you to create different versions of the model as you do that. So you have v1, v2, v3, v4. This allows me to continue to make sure that I can do A-B testing of that new model. So if it's happening over the day and there's a new model landing, I can maybe decide that what I'll always do, as a matter of course, is 30% of the workload will go into the new model, 70% will continue in the old model. Once I'm happy everything's in place, I can make the switch. Dataflow allows you to do in situ updates, so you can actually update the data flow as it's running. It will take care of uh, uh, redistributing the code. And at that point, switch onto the new model until another model comes along, and I switch it back out. And these are the kind of things that allows us to take the data science and actually make them production and usable very, very efficiently. OK, so back over to Lack. Yeah, thanks. Uh, could we get back to the demo machine? Okay. I'm sorry? Do you want slide? Yeah, I want the demo. The demo machine. Yes, please. the demo machine, please. Right. So just to recap, right? Uh, first thing is, uh, in order to do something like this, in order to do something like this to make it easy, notice that the first thing that Reza did was that he made sure that he took all the data before he did all the sliding windows, before he did ag all the aggregations. There is this nice little thing that says write raw data to BQ. That's where everything starts. If you're not storing data, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to any place that's auto awesome. The first thing is save your data. And once you have saved the data, we can then go, and that's basically that is the data that Alex could basically use in his data lab. And you notice that his data lab started with BigQuery. He, ba he went into BigQuery and said, let me go ahead and pull my data, right? BQ.query. 
right? That's essentially the basic first step that you need to be able to do. You need to be saving the data in order to, base, to go back and replace the kinds of systems that you are doing now with something better. Right? Cannot emphasize this uh, more. Make sure to save your data. Notice some of the other things that happened, right? As uh, Alex built uh, the data lab model and he deployed it, it was a very simple CloudML deploy. It went onto the cloud. And he essentially got something that could be called with a REST API. And Razor knew that he didn't have to worry that this model that Alex had built, built by a scientist, was actually going to work in production. It was because it's basically running in the CloudML service. And Razor could simply invoke a, re invoke a REST API call from his data flow code. You know, these are the kinds of like, engineering uh, improvements and guarantees that enable you to do good data engineering and data science on GCP, right? And, and you know, Razor went ahead and, and, and pointed out a few other things, like the ability to do A-B testing, to be able to have both the old service and the new service running at the same time, so you, you basically build confidence in your business users before you actually make the switch. Could we get back to the slides, please? So bottom line then, that is that this is now an amazing time to be a data engineer and a data scientist. And the reason it's an amazing time to be a data engineer and a data scientist is that the amount of work that you need to do has gone dramatically down. Right? If you're thinking about building machine learning models, the amount of work that you need to do to build a machine learning model fits in a single data lab notebook. And if you looked at the code for that single data lab notebook as a first start, it was all like, you know, structured data, go ahead and pre-process. Structured data, go ahead and train. It was single uh, you know, calls on the Python API. It was a, a very easy way to get started doing machine learning, starting with structured data. And great time to be a data engi engineer because, again, you can write data flow code and have all the DevOps and have all the auto scaling and all of those things be taken care of by the cloud, right? So what exactly does auto awesome mean to you as a data engineer or as a data scientist, right? As a data engineer, I think what it means is that whether you're doing ingestion, notice that Razor started out ingesting data with Cloud PubSub. And it could scale from tens of messages to millions of messages, from local to global. And he didn't have to lift a finger, right? He just set up a topic, and that was it. And then anybody could basically post into that topic. The ingestion was auto awesome. Transformation, how did Razor do the transformation? He used Apache Beam cloud data flow. He wrote his code in Apache Beam, which is totally open source. He executed it using cloud data flow on GCP. And that essentially, again, enabled the transformation code to be like automatic, right? And we talked about how you can basically deploy a new service, and you can replace a running pipeline. How amazing is that, right? To be able to replace a running pipeline, to not lose any messages in the process of replacing a running pipeline. I mean, that's the key thing, right? When you say you can replace a running pipeline, what you're saying is your old pipeline processes until a certain message, and the new pipeline takes on at the next message. And you're not actually lost any message in the process, right? You can replace a running pipeline with you no know, transformation. And the other thing, we kind of glossed over it a little bit, but as the data flow pipeline was writing things out, it was writing them into BigQuery, and we could be querying the data even as it was done. You saw the Firebase app. The Firebase app was making a query into BigQuery even as the data was streaming in. Okay. Again, we made it look very easy, right? But this is extremely, extremely hard. Think about being able to do querying on streaming data. Right? We're doing SQL queries on streaming data to power that Firebase graphical thing. And finally, to be able to do your training on your machine learning model. Okay? And the good thing is that all of this 
will auto scale to thousands of machines on demand. All we are writing is we are writing code. We're writing code, we're defining the logic, and everything else is just auto scaling. Okay? The, odd, the, the other thing that we took huge advantage of was that when Alex did his training, he was training it on batch data. But then when we did the predictions, we were predicting on streaming data. Right? And it was actually a very easy transition. And the only reason that it was a very easy transition was that Razor was using Dataflow. And Dataflow is a programming model that lets you deal with batch data and streaming data in exactly the same way. So we could train a model on historical data, which is what you always do, but you predict on newly arriving data, which is what you always want. Okay. And we didn't get into this, but the model that Alex built, that was his first model, and over time, we'll need to do hyperparameter tuning. We'll need to tune the models. And all of that is also automatic. Right? All of these things about tuning your model, making them better, right? they, those can also be all part of your whole process of making them completely automatic. So bottom line then, right? what, data, what GCP offers to data scientists, to data engineers, is that we offer a way to fuel your innovation. You write your innovation, we give you the rocket ship. Right? We give you the rocket ship to fuel your innovation. Right? Whether you're talking about ingestion with PubSub, you're talking about transformation with Dataflow, you're talking about uh, analyzing your data with BigQuery, doing your experimentation with Data Lab, you're doing machine learning with CloudML. It all just works, and that's that's. Uh, uh, like ultimately the thing that, that makes it all, you know, it all, it all, it's all very well integrated and it provides you a huge amount of innovation. Okay. So quick shout out to uh, related sessions. Uh, today at 2.40 p.m. there is an IoT solution uh, on uh, Google Cloud. Okay. And uh, there is an, an, another talk on Apache Beam, how to do portable and parallel data processing. So both of those are very related to this session in terms of being able to do stream processing. And if you looked at this session and say, hey, these are all the kinds of things that I do these days, strongly encourage you to go visit the certification lounge. The data engineer certification on Google Cloud is currently in beta, so it's discounted. So please go ahead and give it a try. Right? You, can, you can take the exam right here uh, at, at Next. And thirdly, the shameless plug, uh, uh, there is a, my book, Data Science on GCP, which basically goes from uh, you know, ingestion all the way to machine learning, kind of the same kind of thing that we talked about here, but using a use case that's around predicting flight delays, how to ingest data and then go all the way to doing streaming, real-time predictions using time windows, et cetera. So I st step you through this entire process. The book is in early release, so you can go to the O'Reilly website, you can start reading the book now. So thank you all very much. <laughs>